Minds are changing when it comes to transgenderism and gender ideology for the better. This is good news amidst a lot of crazy and sad news, like the president of the United States putting the pride flag front and center on the White House and also some crazy stuff about Megan Fox raising her boy to be a girl and also a tragedy that I read in the news the other day about Olympian track star Tori Bowie dying in childbirth at her home. Unfortunately, she is being used as a political prop to push a narrative about race in America that is just not based in truth. So we will correct the record on all of that. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Use code Allie at checkout. That's GoodRanchers.com. Code Allie. Hey guys, welcome to Relatable. Happy Thursday. Hope everyone has had a wonderful week. Well, we haven't had any controversial episodes this week at all. Not at all. Not at all. My DMs are such a lovely place on Instagram right now. Uh, Actually, for the most part, Tuesday and Wednesday's episodes with Dr. McFillin have been received in an extremely positive way. And actually, the most positive and grateful messages I've gotten have been from people who struggle with depression and anxiety and have been on so-called antidepressants or SSRIs, or you had a loved one who was on these prescriptions and you saw some of the effects of these medications. Now, it does not surprise me, and it's okay with me, that I got some messages and a lot of comments from people yesterday saying that they were upset by this episode, they were upset by the clip that I played, and they, you know, say the things that people say that this is dangerous, this is unscientific, this is misinformation. It's interesting because it's the same kind of language that progressives use about everything that the right says. And then a lot of people on the right employ the same kind of language when it comes to an assertion that they don't agree with. Uh, But I haven't seen anyone, whether they have doctor in their Instagram handle or no matter what their story is, actually refute to me what Dr. McFillin said over the past two days. Now, I am not a psychologist. I do not have a medical degree. So I'm not saying that legitimate refutation does not exist. They're varying perspectives. I understand that. But he made some objective points. He made some data-backed points about the safety studies of so-called antidepressants and SSRIs. He talked a lot about the importance of emotional regulation. And so I would like to see those, if you are going to come in and say that this is dangerous, this is misinformation, that we shouldn't be platforming this kind of message, I would like to see you address specifically the points that he made, especially when it comes to the safety of these medications and how little data we actually have on the long-term effects of them. Isn't that something we should all care about? Even if you feel that you have really benefited from one of these medications, even if you feel like your life depends on these medications and you'll never get off these medications. All right, I cannot take that from you. I'm not even trying to take that from you, but shouldn't we all care that there is a lack of long-term data on this stuff and that there are some serious side effects that come with these drugs that are very often not told to the patient or the family members. I mean, I have gotten stories from some of you who are upset that I interviewed Dr. McFillin, but honestly, the most poignant and the most tragic and the most just uh, anger-provoking, saddening messages that I've gotten have been from those of you who have suffered the effects of these SSRIs. If you don't know what that is, you can go listen to the last two days of the episodes that I did with Dr. McFillin. Or you had a loved one suffer from these effects and you were not told. You weren't told, your loved one wasn't told, and sometimes it ends in irreversible choices. Um, not realizing that it wasn't actually the diagnosis of depression or anxiety that led to um, 
that led to someone going to a really dark place, either thinking about doing dark things or actually committing dark acts against themselves or other people. Um, but it was actually the medications that they were put on. I'm not saying that that's going to be the effect for everyone, but shouldn't we all care that that's a risk? Like, shouldn't we all care that we are being over medicalized? I was thinking about this, and this is not coming from someone who is anti-medication, anti-modern medicine. I've said before I'm crunchy in some ways, but I am not crunchy in a lot of ways. Like, I really appreciate modern medicine. And again, as I said, there are varying perspectives of this. I certainly don't claim to be the arbiter of you know, what is completely and totally unconditionally objectively true when it comes to the subject. But I I was thinking about the over-medicalization of normal human emotions, normal feelings of distraction, normal levels of depression, normal levels of anxiety. I think when we use terms like depression and anxiety, rather than words like sad or worried, we tend to justify a medical diagnosis and then medical prescriptions when perhaps they are not necessary. Like if we started calling antidepressants, anti-sad medication or anti-anxiety medication, anti-worry medication, you kind of start to see that you're trying to suppress normal human emotions. I'm not speaking to your particular story. I'm not saying that you can't feel like you've really improved because of the medications that you are prescribed. I'm not saying that. But when it comes to normal levels of sadness and normal levels of anxiety and worry that everyone feels for a variety of reasons. I do wonder if we just have been conditioned, as Dr. McFillin said, to think that these are medical diagnoses in every case when they are not always. Um, One of you messaged me a story about how you felt so much depression after you lost your baby about halfway through your pregnancy. And immediately you were offered by two doctors antidepressants because you were so sad. You didn't want to get out of bed. You didn't want to function. And this person told me they knew like this is what depression feels like. It is just like a weight that is holding you down and you feel like it. it, nothing alleviates it. But this person also said, there's a reason that I'm sad. There's a reason that I'm going through something that's really difficult. And it's okay for me to feel depressed. It's okay for me to not want to get out of bed. It's okay for me to feel like I can't even put one foot in front of the other. And this person decided not to go on antidepressants. Again, I'm not making medical recommendations for you, but I do think that there is a problem with how hard this stuff is being pushed with out full education of all of the side effects. I can't take away your story and your experience. Um, If you feel like you have been positively impacted by these medications, that's not what I'm trying to do. But I do think that it's really important that we hear out psychologists like Dr. McFillin who are being censored. Shouldn't like didn't COVID teach us something? about the control that the pharmaceutical companies have on these institutions that are telling us this is just science, this is just science, this is good for you, this is how you love your neighbor. Like, didn't we learn something about that over the past two years, that if YouTube and Twitter and Facebook are all going to censor one perspective that happens to be against the money-making apparatus of these pharmaceutical companies, that we should at least, at the very least, hear that perspective out? So I just encourage you, like if you were maybe just initially peeved or or hurt by the titles of the past two days episodes, or if you saw the clip on Instagram and it just threw you into a rage because you were so angry, go listen to the episodes. Maybe you still disagree. Maybe you have medical expertise and like you have pushback, but I, I really encourage you to one, specifically refute him and two, just Listen to what he has to say, because even if you disagree ultimately with what he said about SSRIs, 
He has a lot of insight into the corruption that is our medical system in the United States. So anyway, we'll have him back on. So much positive feedback from you guys. So much positive feedback. Y'all y'all want him back on to talk about ADD medication and things like that, which is someone who feels like I have undiagnosed ADD. Like I'm really interested to hear his take on that. Um, all right, let's move on to some of the other things that we are talking about today. But first, let me pause. Let me tell you about our first sponsor for the day, and that is Public Square. I don't have to tell y'all. I don't have to tell y'all things are going crazy. These corporations do not care about what you and I have to say or our opinion for the most part. They care about their DEI score, their ESG score, their CEI score, all the stuff that we've talked about. And so that means being as progressive as possible, pushing things that go against our values. So we should, as much as we can, support companies that actually align with our principles and align with our values. Public Square makes that really easy. It's an app that you download on your phone. You can go to publicsq.com. That's how it's spelled, but it's actually pronounced or you say it public square you can enter in your location your email address and then local businesses and services run by people who care about the things that you and I do will pop up and you can support them and also if you are a business owner you can list your business on the public square app so that people can find you and support you this is a wonderful service in this growing parallel economy that conservatives are creating in the united states so go to publicsq.com that's publicsq.com download the app now publicsq.com all right uh let's get to the rest of our episode and one more thing that i just want to say about that too is that Dr. McFillin did not minimize the reality of these very painful emotions and seasons that you might be going through. He just has a different take on them and a different solution to them than simply taking a medication that will just bring you to a place of numbing. So I just want to say that because I saw some people saying, oh, they're saying that um, mental illness isn't real or like mental health isn't a real issue or minimizing it or saying that you should just like pray it away. That's not at all what was said. So please don't just presumptuously comment or message until you've really heard it out and make sure that you are not inserting maybe like your own fears into what he is saying by, you know, saying something that he didn't say. All right. Speaking of fear, I am very scared of this large and just grotesque, grotesque pride flag that was uh, displayed uh, on the White House by President Biden. We will, yes, this beautiful picture. You'll remember the pride flag used to just have rainbow colors. We can keep it up for a little bit. But now it's got this t- weird like triangle thing in it. And I still am not totally sure what the black and brown stands for. I still don't know. Is that the color of people's skin? Is that a sexual orientation? If it's the color of people's skin, like what does it have to do with who these people prefer to have intercourse with? I I don't understand. But then, of course, we have the pink and the blue now on the pride flag. So it's just become more and more uh, garish over time. And of course, as you keep on adding letters, you have to keep on adding colors to represent all of those letters. And then it is going to just continue to just be a mass, a mass of colors. Um, And let me just remind you also about the pink and the blue in the pride flag. The pink and the blue in the pride flag, it's the transgender part of the transgender flag, which is the light pink and the light blue and the white. I believe these are baby colors. I've always thought that this was creepy. I've always thought that it was weird that people weren't more embarrassed by this, by the fact that a man who goes by the name of Monica Helms actually invented this flag several years ago. Now, Monica, I don't even know, I think his name is Robert Hogue, but he invented this flag uh, to actually represent like these infantile 
colors on purpose because he has fantasies of being stuck in a six-year-old girl's body. He has fantasies of age regression. He's actually written extensively about this. You can look up Monica Helms and some of the books and the articles, the pieces that she has written. She actually fantasizes about being like a little girl in a tutu. This is who created the transgender flag. Like everywhere you turn when you look at this kind of gender ideology, you see this kind of infantilization. You should make of that what you will. Make of that what you will. But here we have the president of the United States, the uniter in chief, the empath in chief, you guys. The the man that all Christians should have voted for if you really cared about loving your neighbor and you really upheld decency. Evangelicals for Biden. No, pro-life evangelicals for Biden. I think that was the name of the group said we have to uphold the tenets of Christianity by voting for Joe Biden and not that mean racist bully Donald Trump. And they said, okay, we're pro-life evangelicals. We're just going to look past the fact that this guy actually advocates for illegal abortion through all nine months. We're actually going to look past the fact that he is advocating for overturning the Hyde Amendment. The Hyde Amendment protects federal tax dollars from funding abortion. We're going to look past the fact that his administration is now funding and enabling and promoting the butchering of children's bodies by pushing this radical idea that it's actually possible to change your gender and, in fact, possible to change your gender as a minor. All of these things we are still told to this day by this uh, contingency of professing Christians um, that they're all just kind of these small culture war issues that we shouldn't really focus on, that really we should focus on the fact that he is so nice, that he's so compassionate, and that Democrats care so much about immigrants and about black people and about Poor people that, you know, it's six in one, half dozen in the other when you're looking at Republicans and Democrats. And at the end of the day, you just need to vote for the party that makes you feel good inside. Like, honestly, that is as far as some professing Christians who vote Democrat have really thought about the issues. And they'll look at something like this, that you've got the president of the United States hoisting up what God calls an abomination, what God calls sin, the God who is love, the God who is wisdom, the God who is justice, says that this is sin, says that this is destructive for the body, says that this is destructive for the soul, says this is therefore destructive for societies and nations. We've got the president of the United States, a professing Christian himself, displaying the representation of this kind of degeneracy and sadness and confusion and abomination at the White House. You will actually have professing Christians look past this or even say it's fine, that this is just showing people love. This is just making people feel true, that they can be true to who they are. This is celebrating authenticity. Look, if that is how you think about what God calls sin, then I'm not really... I'm not really sure you're there. Like, I'm not really sure you really know who God is. Because if you're not willing to keep his commandments, like if you don't trust what his word says, like if you don't really believe in his definitions of what he calls good and what he calls bad, if you believe in your own definitions of these things, if you believe that maybe the world and you are more compassionate than him, I'm not so sure you love him. I'm not so sure about that. Um, I, I commented on this with part of Romans one, of course, all of Romans one is applicable here. And this made some people mad, but I thought that the verse in Romans one or the verses in Romans one that applied the best were, um, Romans 1, 18 through 19, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. That's Romans 1, 18. And some people, they see this display and they're like, when is God just going to judge us? We deserve his judgment. We deserve his condemnation. Like this is the judgment. This is the judgment that we have wicked rulers that are making easy and accessible the butchering of people's bodies, including children's bodies in the name of self-love. 
That's what it is. This is the judgment. We're not waiting for the judgment to happen. This is the judgment. We have wicked, evil rulers that are pushing chaos and confusion in the name of compassion. Remember 2 Timothy 3. But understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power, avoid such people. Lovers of self. Interesting. We're told that that's a Christian virtue today. I wrote a book about that, actually, that that's not a Christian virtue. Neither is self-loathing, by the way, but self-forgetfulness is. Obedience to God is. Being a new creation that has been bought with a price by Christ is a Christian value. And that sends us neither to um, self-adoration nor self-deprecation, but rather a form of self-forgetfulness that comes with full surrender to God. And yet in the last days we are told, and I don't know, by the way, when those, I don't know when Jesus is coming back. Some people feel very strongly that it's right now. None of us really know the day or the hour. Of course, that depends on your eschatological view. But we do read that Uh, lovers of self and lovers of money are markers of times of difficulty and disobedience to God, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness. Isn't that interesting? Like, it's not just that in the last days, we're going to see this treachery and we're going to see this evil and wickedness and violence and all of this stuff and disobedience to parents. But in all of these things, there will be an appearance of godliness. So you see that in the defense of this kind of act by the president of the United States, people who profess to be Christians, people like Jen Hatmaker, who we talked about last week, um, saying, no, this is just loving your neighbor. Like this, I actually had someone who I've had on this podcast before, Brandon Robertson. We debated abortion. You can go see how that went on uh, a previous episode, say that, you know, this is a wonderful display of God's love and the diversity of his creation. Of course, Brandon rejects virtually all of scripture, but even the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, which is Genesis 1. But we see that there is an appearance of godliness that is put over this kind of abomination. But denying its power, avoid such people. Now, this is what I love this passage because I think this is so true about the self-love and toxic empathy movement, which really go hand in hand. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning, but never able to arrive at a knowledge of truth. Jen Hatmaker, Rachel Hollis, Glennon Doyle. Just as James and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men must also also oppose the truth. Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith, but they will not get very far for their folly will be plain to all as was that of those two men. Thankfully, we have at the end of that chapter comfort. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. We don't have to follow the chaos and the confusion of this world, of these self-help leaders, of these self-love propagators, of the president of the United States. We don't have to follow these people. We don't have to be confused about what is right and what is wrong, what is male and what is female. We have the gracious clarity given to us in the word of God. And a much lesser point to be made that others are making is that this seems to violate the U.S. flag code, which says under the subsection position and manner of display, Section E of the flag of the United States of America should be at the center and at the highest point of the group when a number of flags of states or localities or pennants of societies are grouped and displayed from staff. So let's put up that picture. You can see that at the White House, the pride flag is right in the middle, and then you've got the two American flags flanking it. And so this does seem 
to show the pride flag in a position of prominence and then the American flag in lesser positions. Now, there are some authors, there are some journalists coming out like from Forbes saying, oh, no, 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 this is not a violation. Uh, The author of this Forbes article claims that the photos didn't show the U.S. flag flying atop the White House, which he claims would mean the flag display adhered to the U.S. flag code uh Corinne Jean-Pierre totally forgot about this person I I totally forgot that we were having like press conferences I haven't seen anything about this in such a long time honestly very smart of them because she is not good at her job she's not good at her job the last press secretary I forgot her name she was good at her job now we might be frustrated we might have been frustrated with her because as conservatives she was you know she wasn't telling the truth and we didn't like her answers. We didn't like her stances on things. But she was Jin Saki. That's her name. She was good at her job. Corinne Jean-Pierre, not good at her job. So it's better for everyone that these press conferences are not widely advertised. So someone asks about the whole pride flag display at the White House. And here's what she had to say. There's been some criticism also of um, the White House, the flag placement, the pride flag violating the U.S. flag code. Did anybody notice that or, or fail to notice that or was it a, a, an intentional statement? Just explain what happened. With that. So the administration was proud again uh, to display uh, the pride uh, flag. Uh, it was a historic event at the White House. Uh, it's centered around the love uh, around love and family, and I think that's important. And uh, so, you know, we're not going to to let anyone distract us from that. Okay, that doesn't really answer our question. Uh, this is about love and family. And yet we had this dude who is apparently some TikTok influencer, you know, a man identifying as a woman who has had some surgeries, I don't know how many, to try to appear as a woman who took his shirt off and was flashing his moves to the camera and people were all uh you know I guess applauding this at the White House and then you had some women who identify as men who have done the opposite they've actually removed uh the breast that God gave them and they've got the double mastectomy scars and they are um uh they're displaying this as well topless on the White House lawn now you'll remember that he ran on decency right pro life evangelicals for Biden Where are you on this one? How's the decency going? How's the unity going? How does it feel? Does it feel good? Not so sure about that. Now, I will not retweet that video. I saw so many conservatives reacting to it. And you see this a lot. I'm not saying that I've never been guilty of something like this, but I've tried to be more cognizant of this, especially just like over the past year or so or over the past few months of not sharing the supremely grotesque stuff that we see on the left. Like the very sexual stuff, especially the kind of drag queen shows and things that involve like the children who are watching or the children who are made to perform. I understand why conservatives share it because you're wanting to show people who just like blah, 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 blah. They don't want to they don't want to see it like they've got their ears plugged. They've got their eyes covered. They just want to pretend like it's not happening. So I understand why conservatives retweet it why they show it, because they want to prove that the things that we are lambasting are real, that it's not just a figment of our imagination. But I just don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want that on my timeline. I don't want to share it. I don't think you guys want to see it. Hopefully I have enough credibility with you guys that you will just believe me if I say something happened. I don't need to show you a picture. And I'm sorry, like, especially when it's something sexual, when it's nudity or something, I don't want to contribute to someone's lust. I don't want to contribute to, you know, someone's struggle. If you struggle with like lust or pornography or something like that, I don't want to contribute to that. And sometimes I just don't think that we need to actually see something in order to, in order for it to um, sink in, for, in order for us to know that evil is happening. I think it can just pollute our minds and take our minds to really like sad, dark places that they don't need to go. So just trust me that this is happening This administration is a judgment. It is a judgment on our society. We are reaping the wrath of God in some ways. And like the chickens won't come home to roost, especially when it comes to these gender policies pushed by this administration. Not fully for a long time. 
Like we have not seen the full effects of the damaging and destructive properties of gender ideology that is being pushed ferociously from the top down. All right, let's get into another example of this um, in just a second. Let me pause. Let me tell you about our next sponsor for the day, and that is Preborn. Let's talk about something good. Preborn is an amazing organization. It's a network of uh, clinics that has rescued over 200,000 babies by introducing moms to their baby via free ultrasound. That's what they do. They really want women to actually be informed. You hear a lot from pro-choice people, oh, we need to make sure that everyone is informed. Yay, science. And yet they are so often against these women getting sonograms and seeing the humanity of their child in the womb and hearing a heartbeat. If you're really pro-choice, don't you want that choice to be informed? But the fact of the matter is when most women see that baby, they see the humanity that it's not just this blob or clump of cells. They are so much less likely to abort. That's why preborn exists. The Blaze actually has a a goal of saving 70,000 babies this year. You can contribute to that. If you go to preborn.com slash Allie, preborn.com slash Allie, go ahead and donate. You can contribute to this free ultrasound. One ultrasound is just $28. Dollars, obviously, the more you donate, the more ultrasounds you can guarantee to women. Go to preborn.com slash Allie and donate today. Preborn.com slash Allie. All right, I want to talk about this Megan Fox story about her apparently raising her boys to be gender neutral or to be female. She's got three boys. This picture was circulating of Megan and her three sons, all of them seem to kind of be dressed as girls, especially one of them. And I won't show their faces because they are children, but this has been, she's been very open about this. This is not a secret. She's been talking about her kids being um, gender neutral. And I'll read some of the quotes from the articles, but Robbie Starbuck is kind of the one who has been commenting about this. He claims that he knew her and her family back when he lived in Calabasas. Now, I'm not going to repeat the claim that he made because I don't know if it's true. I don't know that his personal experience with her, I'm not saying that he's lying. I just haven't been able to verify it. And I wouldn't like someone to repeat something that may not, that is not verifiable by me. But he claims that he knew the family and that something is going on uh, behind the scenes here. But I don't even think that we have to we have to know really what went on behind the scenes based on what we have seen publicly from her in regards to how she raises her three sons. But she did want to respond to Robbie Starbuck and his accusations that strange things are going on behind the scenes when it comes to how she's raising her children. And uh, here's what she had to say to Robbie, who is a conservative commentator. He's a former Republican congressional candidate in Tennessee. Here's what she had to say to her tens of millions of Instagram followers. Hey, Robbie Starbuck, I really don't want to give you this attention because you're a clout chaser, but let me tell you something. Irregardless, I just need a moment of silence for that. Irregardless, she says. Irregardless. It's just regardless. Okay. Irregardless was a joke on Mean Girls when Gretchen Wiener said it. And we were all laughing back in 2006 because irregardless isn't a word. It means the opposite of what you're trying to say. Okay. So she means to say, regardless of how desperate you may become at any given time to acquire wealth, power, success, or fame, never use children as leverage or social currency, which I agree with, by the way, especially under malevolent and erroneous pretense. Whew. Those are big words for someone who just said it regardless. Um, exploiting my child's gender identity to gain attention in your political campaign has put you on the wrong side of the universe. I've been burned at the stake by insecure, narcissistic, impotent little men like you many times. And yet I'm still here. You aft with the wrong witch. That is really really scary, and then posted on her Instagram story, this New York Post story. This New York Post story is about um, a woman who caught on her security camera two naked women who were doing this kind of witch ritual, eating the carcass of a dead deer. So Megan Fox reposted that story and said, 
uh, me outside of Robbie Starbucks's house. And like, this is why I think this, this is part of why I think this story is so important. I really don't like talking about like people's families and things like that. But I do think that there is a trend because we've all seen the pictures of celebrities dressing their sons in very feminine ways. I don't know what's going on behind the scenes at Megan Fox's house. I will not assume to know everything. I have. I don't know if Robbie Starbucks's story is true. I am not saying it's true, but the pictures are there of her boys being dressed up like little girls. And then her saying that basically she's a witch that is what going to do some kind of deer eating ritual outside of Robbie Starbucks's house because he pointed to the fact that it's very disturbing that her boys are being dressed up in this way. So Megan Fox also said to Parade Magazine, uh, Fox and Green share three sons. This is what Parade Magazine said. There are not many public photos of the Green children online, but in the ones that exist, each child appears to have long hair, which sometimes prompts people to ask questions about their genders. Fox has spoken publicly about choosing to raise her three boys as gender neutral. When I became pregnant with Noah, this is what she says. When I became pregnant with Noah, I could feel through my mother's intuition, I suppose, that he was not subscribing to gender t- stereotypes. So I decided to provide an environment for him early on that would allow him him to discover how he wanted to express himself. So she knew neonatally that her son was not really a boy. These people are very unwell. They're unwell. It's really, really sad. And amazingly, they are still looked up to by many as like voices on important issues that we should all be listening to, like a moral, like moral betters. In April, 2022, in an interview with Glamour, Megan Fox said, Noah started wearing dresses when he was about two, and I bought a bunch of books that sort of addressed these things and addressed a full spectrum of what this is. Some of the books are written by transgender children. Some of the books are just about how you can be a boy and wear a dress. You can express yourself through clothing however you want, and that doesn't even have to have anything to do with your sexuality. So from the time they were very young, I've incorporated those things into their daily lives so that nobody feels like they're weird or strange or different. I understand wanting your kids to feel accepted and feel loved. I really understand that. But as parents, we owe our kids clarity. We owe our kids the the knowledge that you were not born an accident, that your body means something, that it's important, that it's really good to be a boy, that it's really good to be a girl. No, that doesn't mean that you have to conform to every gender stereotype that exists. Yes, it's okay to be a girl who loves sports and loves loves dirt bikes and things like that. Sure, a boy can love ballet, but these are fixed categories that we cannot change. And fluidity is just confusion. And I think it's a form of actually mental torture for our kids. And so even though we have been told today that love means unconditional affirmation of everything our kids have to say or everything anyone has to say, that's just not true. Love and truth go hand in hand. Actually, you're not loving someone if you are not also bringing truth. The truth is, is that we do live in a gender binary that is determined at the moment of conception by our chromosomes. And there are different uh, roles that men and women play. There are different characteristics that men and women have that are um, important. And the physical characteristics that we have are totally immutable no matter how you dress. And so... I don't know the state of the conflict between Robbie Starbuck and between Megan Fox at this point, but there it is. Um, And I just think that there's a lot more of this going on in Hollywood probably than we realize. Some people think it's a conspiracy theory that they tie all of or they say that any, you know, skepticism about what goes on in Hollywood and Hollywood's families and what happens to children in Hollywood, that it's all part of some QAnon conspiracy theory. But I think that we can all just use a little bit of reasoning and a little bit of logic to look inside what's going on and say, that doesn't seem normal. That that just doesn't seem right. Um, so this is an unfortunate, this is an unfortunate story. And I hope that redemption comes upon the house of Megan Fox and her children and that the Lord would lead them in truth. Um, all right. I wanted to get to a positive story, uh, about the gender binary and how actually most people 
are not buying what people like Megan Fox or the president of the United States is selling. I saw this study. Actually, I saw it retweeted by a liberal person who was decrying the results of the study. So I was like, ooh, this is going to be good. And it is a study from the Public Religion Research Institute, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that says they are dedicated to conducting independent research at the intersection of religion, culture, and public policy, that says that people are moving to, I don't know if you would say to the right, but towards truth when it comes to the existence of uh, the gender binary. So this was conducted among 5,438 individuals during March of 2023, people of all different uh, backgrounds, males, females, political affiliations, religious affiliations, age groups. Uh, they were recruited into this study and then they were asked a series of questions to determine what they think um, about genders. Unsurprisingly, there's a big difference between Republicans and Democrats when it comes to this. 90% of Republicans say that there are only two genders compared to 66% of independents and 44% of Democrats, 44% of Democrats, only 44% say that there are only two genders. 92% of white evangelical Christians believe that there are only two genders. That group is always the most conservative among any of the religious groups ever polled. 71% of black Protestants, 69% of white Catholics, 66% uh, of Latino Catholics believe there are only two genders compared with 46% who don't have a religious affiliation. It's so interesting and kind of ironic in a way based on the accusations of religious people just not existing in reality and being anti-science that the more religious you are the more tethered you actually are to reality and to science by generation 57 percent of gen z i'm actually kind of excited about that 57 percent of gen z believe there are only two genders good job guys proud of you 60 percent of millennials really guys like we have mortgages at this point only 60 percent I was okay with 57% of Gen Z because some of their brains literally aren't formed yet. 60% of millennials, come on, guys, that's not even two-thirds of us know that there are two genders. 71% of Gen X, 68% of baby boomers, and 69% of the silent generation. Still way too few. I kind of wonder, like, how many people even understood the question. Like, how many people in the silent generation? That's like my grandmother, who has since passed. That's, I mean, she was born in 1936. If I had asked my grandmother before she died, do, or like, what do you think about the gender binary? I, I'm not sure that she would have understood anything of what I was saying. I'm just not sure that I believe that 69% of the silent generation, like people born in the Great Depression, believe that there are only two genders. And that the other part of the silent generation, like they believe that you can be genderqueer. I don't, I'm not buying that. In 2021, 86% of white evangelical Protestants said that there are only two genders. And now it's 92%. What up? Good job, guys. Other Protestants of color went from 52. This is crazy. This is a huge jump, guys. So other Protestants of color. So Hispanic, Black, other Protestants of color went from 52% believing in a gender binary in 2021. That's low, guys. Now it's 73% in 2023. Hispanic Catholics went from 48% in 2021 to 66% in 2023. So people are just waking up to it. They're seeing this stuff. And whether, like, whether progressives like this or not, Yes, the drag queen story hour and the drag queen with kids and the kids being maimed, all of that is put under the same umbrella in most people's minds of transgenderism. Like you trying to split hairs between, oh, drag queen and transgenderism, that's not clicking with most people, okay? Like all the stuff with the kids that we're seeing with the changing of the gender and telling the boys that they can be a girl and celebrities dressing their boys up as girls, it all falls under the same category. Most people don't want anything to do with that. And then we've got some other stats on this. 
Um, Stats on gender identity, so-called, in public schools. When looking at views on teaching about gender identity in public schools, only 7% of Americans think teaching that some people do not consider themselves to be a man or a woman is appropriate in early elementary school. 11% say uh, in later elementary school. What are you guys on? 26% say in middle school and 18% say in high school. That's interesting. While 36% believe that it is never appropriate to teach this idea in public schools. Similarly, 8% of all Americans think it is appropriate to teach that some people are transgender. Wow. So why are we seeing what we do? Why why are we seeing this? That's because most people are not for it, but they won't speak up on it. Like they don't have the courage to say anything about it, or they just don't think it's going to affect their family or affect their community. This is really a case of the silent majority. And we're talking silent vast majority. So we can't be we can't be fooled by what we see on Instagram or what we see on Twitter, thinking that most people believe that it's okay or that it's even possible to switch genders. Most people don't believe that. Most people don't want kids involved, and people's minds are being changed towards the gender binary, which is just reality. It's crazy that we even have to have polls about this. Uh, White evangelicals, Latter-day Saints, and Hispanic Protestants are the only religious groups in which majorities of adherents say that young people are being peer pressured into being transgender. But it's actually true. Like, we're actually seeing this in schools. And maybe someone is not coming up to a child and saying, you need to be the opposite sex, but they're suggesting it. There's power of suggestion, especially by someone who is in authority to say, you will be celebrated. This can be our little secret. This is um, something that you can don here at school that you don't have to tell your parents about. There is something enticing about that for kids. And we've seen story after story of this happening. Um. And so once again, I would say the more religious you are, the more tethered you are to reality, especially white evangelicals. Like I'm always I'm always told that, you know, especially by my Catholic friends who I really like, oh, Protestantism is like the reason for progressivism or it's the reason for liberalism. And time and time again, in every poll, in every data set, it's actually white evangelicals that are far more conservative on all of these issues. Um, than my Catholic friends or really people of any other faith. Um, And there are a variety of of reasons for that. Um, But I always just think that that argument is interesting because it doesn't matter if it's from Pew Research or YouGov or this organization. White evangelicals are always the most conservative when it comes to any kind of culture war or political issue. So this is good. This is something that we should be celebrating, that minds are changing for the better, especially when it comes to Hispanic Catholics and then the other Protestants of color, as they describe them. Minds are changing for the better. So keep going. Like you might not think that speaking up to your friends, that saying something to your church leaders, or that you as a pastor saying something from the pulpit, or you suggesting articles or sharing articles or suggesting books with your friends or sharing this podcast or whatever it is, or speaking up at the school board, whatever it is that you're doing that you feel like maybe is ineffective or not making a difference, you never know what minds are changing. You never know. And plus, it is always worth speaking the truth. And so this is important. Like women's and girls' rights are on the line. Women's privacy is on the line. Women's fairness and competition That's all on the line. Children's bodies are on the line here. This is absolutely worth speaking up about, and it can make a difference. And all those people, all these people, the vast majority of people who don't think this should be pushed on kids, who don't even think it's possible to do, you need to speak up, borrow someone's courage, and use it. Uh, All right. I want to talk about one more thing. Let me tell you about our next sponsor for the day. That is Freedom Project Academy. Uh, So I don't have to tell you that things are crazy in school. We just talked about that, how gender ideology and other kinds of ideologies are taking over, especially public school curriculum, making it difficult for kids to actually learn the things they need to learn because they're too busy becoming left-wing activists. If you want more autonomy over what your child learns, you want to make sure that they are being instilled with good values you should check out Freedom Project Academy. They've perfected online learning, offering live on-demand and homeschool courses for kindergarten through 12th graders. Freedom Project Academy 
It was built on biblical values and classical curriculum. They're dedicated to subject matter that teaches your kids how to think. You can save 10% on tuition when you enroll today at freedomforschool.com. That's freedomforschool.com. All right, I had a lot to talk about today because I was on vacation earlier this week, and so I didn't get to talk about like all the news things that I wanted to talk about. Um, so I'm trying to decide right now as I speak which story I want to talk about. Do I want to talk about DeSantis being called the Grand Wizard of the KKK at the Tonys the other day? Or do I want to talk about this story that really has nothing to do with anything that we've been talking about, but I just found it very sad? about Tory Bowie. Let's talk about Tory Bowie because I think that this is worth noting and I'm afraid I'm not going to have time to get to it next week. So Tory Bowie, an incredible uh, Olympian track star. She has won several times. Uh, I think back in 2016 was maybe her last title. And we've actually talked about her before. We've talked about her as an example that Duke University has cited when they Uh, looked at the differences between male and female track athletes and how Tori Bowie and Allison Felix are incredibly fast, probably the fastest women in the world, and yet their record time as female Olympians was uh, – it was was beat – 15,000 times, both of their record time, 15,000 times by high school boys. And so it just goes to show that even elite female athletes aren't really competitive against even high school boys. And the differentiator there, Duke University admitted, is testosterone. It is an androgenized body versus a non-androgenized body. So I'm not really someone who follows track, but as soon as I heard that she died, um, that her name struck me because we've talked about her several times on this podcast, just an absolutely incredible athlete. She actually died at the beginning of May. I did not realize that. I only heard that she died after the autopsy results were published. And a lot of people are talking about this because of just how tragic the circumstances where. So uh, this is according to CBS. Three-time Olympic medalist Tori Bowie, who died in early May at the age of 32, was eight months pregnant and in labor at her Florida home at the time of her death. Her agent confirmed Monday, drawing renewed attention to the maternal mortality crisis in the U.S. So the medical examiner said that it could have been, it doesn't say for sure, possible complications, we read, uh, could have been respiratory distress and eclampsia. Eclampsia is a pregnancy condition that is deadly. You can get treatment for it. It's typically called preeclampsia. Very rarely does it develop to eclampsia, which can cause seizures and all kinds of complications that are very dangerous for mothers and their babies. If you're getting the proper treatment, it can be treated and women are deliver all the time um, healthy babies that are healthy themselves after having a diagnosis of preeclampsia, but it seems like she was in labor and actually died at home, not of a home birth. That's what I thought had happened originally. It doesn't, but it doesn't seem like that's the case. Eight months pregnant, I guess, went into labor early. And um, a lot of people are assuming different things that went on. What we know is that she wasn't heard from for two days. And then the police were called to do a welfare check. They did a welfare check. They went in. She and her baby had both died. Her baby uh, was a girl, born stillborn, and she had also died. A lot of mystery still surrounding um, those circumstances. Uh, Most of the reporting that I read, even the obituary, was very vague about the existence of the baby. Actually, a lot of reporting, a lot of articles that you'll read do not mention the baby at all, which I thought was strange. Um, who was the father of the child? I guess Tori Bowie was unmarried. I didn't realize that. Like, there are so many questions that I think a lot of us have. And I think asking the question, too, like, what kind of prenatal care was she receiving? I think that's totally a fair question. But what you will be bombarded with when you look on Twitter is accusations of racism. The brand Bobby on Instagram posted this, that we must do better for black mothers, that this is all about racism and black women not being treated well in our medical system. Look, maybe that was the case for Tori Bowie, but no one can say for sure. 
We have we have no idea and no indication whatsoever that she was a victim of racism and that's why she died. And I just think it's so freaking sad, man, that we use tragedies like this immediately and assume the most popular, political, most divisive narrative that will not actually save women's lives. You know how I know this won't save women's lives? Because Tori Bowie's circumstance is not likely whether you are white or you're black. We're told that it is because of racism, but it's not. So let me tell you some truth about this. CBS reports this, um, that the number of women who died during or shortly after childbirth in the U.S. is higher than any other developed nation, which is true. That's disgusting. That's awful. And the risks are even greater among women of color. That is true. Black women are at least three times more likely to die from a pregnancy related cause than white women, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. That, as far as I can tell, is true. We've talked about that on the show before. That is a travesty, no matter how you slice it. That is obviously very sad. But what we're told immediately, what we're told immediately is that that is because of racism. It's because of systemic racism, because black women aren't believed, because they're not treated as full persons in the medical system. And I don't see evidence of that. Here's here's the truth. And I think that the truth matters. The truth actually matters even in this devastating story of Tori Bowie, because she's being hoisted up as some kind of political object to push a narrative that is not true. So in order to stop that, we actually have to say some things that are true that uh, confound the narrative that she is being used for. According to the CDC, Hispanic women have a lower maternal mortality rate than white women, even though they are on average comparable economically to black women and presumably would experience discrimination because we hear that black and brown people in our system it, they experience discrimination. It's an economic thing. It's a race thing. And yet white women are more likely to die in childbirth or after childbirth than Hispanic women. So if it's really racism, are you saying that Hispanic women for some reason are treated better, more fairly than white women? Again, this is one of those fallacies that we see on the left all the time when it comes to race, that only disparities between white and black people are automatically proof of discrimination, but not disparities between other races and white people if those other races happen to be doing better in some way than white people. Um, There is also, as as we've talked about uh, before, uh, the fact that the number one cause of maternal mortality is not anything that the CDC records, but it's actually homicide, especially for black women. I'm not saying that's what happened to Tori Bowie, but if we want to fix things at all for black women who die after childbirth, then this should be the number one thing that's addressed because it far outweighs the number of any other kinds of death when it comes to pregnancy or postpartum related deaths among black women. So uh, this is a story or uh, uh, this is a study that I've referenced before, and it is in obstetrics and gynecology journal. And they found that homicide during pregnancy or within 42 days of the end of pregnancy exceeded all the leading causes of maternal mortality by more than twofold. Pregnancy was associated with a significantly elevated homicide risk in the black population. Um, So you are more likely to be killed as a black woman if you are pregnant, and you are far more likely to be killed as a black woman, especially a pregnant black woman, than any other race. And here is uh, another study that I've referenced, racial disparities in pregnancy associated intimate partner homicide. The study found that black women evidence pregnancy associated homicide rates more than threefold higher than that observed among white and Hispanic women. The largest intraracial discrepancies between pregnant and non-pregnant women emerged among black women who experienced pregnancy-associated homicide at a rate 8.1 times greater than their non-pregnant peers. The vast majority of these cases are the father of the child or the boyfriend of the mother. So far more than any systemic problem that is claimed to uh, claim to exist in the medical system against black women is this problem of homicide. It is extremely more likely for a black woman to be murdered while she was pregnant or postpartum 
than it is for any other adverse event to happen to her. Tulane University also found this, not just for the United States, but specifically also for the state of Louisiana. Of the 119 pregnancy-associated deaths for 2016 and 2017 in the state of Louisiana, 13.4% or 16 were homicides. The authors estimated that for every 100,000 women who were pregnant or postpartum, there were 12.9 homicide deaths, which outnumbered deaths from any single obstetric cause, including hypertensive disorders and amniotic fluid in entering the bloodstream. The risk of homicide death was twice as high for women and girls during pregnancy in the postpartum period compared to women and girls who were not pregnant. Pregnancy and postpartum deaths were highest for women and girls ages 10 to 29, which is really, really sad. And they found that 50% in the United States, 50% of pregnancy-related homicides are of black women even though they only make up, black women only make up about 8% of the population, 50%. That's the big problem, okay? So I just wanted to confound that narrative that I think Tori Bowie is disgracefully being used for. Like, I don't believe that you really care. I won't believe that you care about the disparities in maternal mortality until you address the number one victimizing factor in a black pregnant woman's life, which is not the healthcare system. You're gonna have to prove that it was bias that killed Tori Bowie. Again, I'm not suggesting that it was homicide at all, but you're gonna have to prove that it was the accusation that you are leveling right now. And so if you can't do that, if you can't prove it, and you have this half-baked narrative that you're just trying to push, then just offer compassion and pray for her family. It's really, really sad. And so, I just wanted to mention that because you're seeing a lot of narrative surrounding that. It's emotional extortion. It's moral manipulation. It's politics being played with someone's life. Um, And so just discount the narrative and just go ahead and pray for her family and offer condolences if and how you can. It's really, really sad. Um, All right. Let me tell you about our last sponsor for the day. That is my Patriot Supply. Okay. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. We never know what's going to happen in the future, but we just want to make sure that our family is safe and secure, especially in the unstable economic times that we're in now. We want to make sure that we're better safe than sorry when it comes to our food supply. That's why we have My Patriot Supply. We've got it stored. Hopefully, we'll never have to use it, but if we do, it's good for 30 years. We can we can pull it out. We can use it. We can eat it. Whenever we need, get a kit for every member of your family. These are 2,000 calorie a day meals. They last for three months, so a really good supply of food. They can ship quickly right to your front door, unmarked boxes for your privacy. You can save $200 on each kit that you need by going to preparewithally.com. Save $200 per kit by going to preparewithally.com. That's preparewithally.com. All right, guys, that's all that we had time for today. I told you that we had to get through a lot because I missed the past couple days of being able to talk about the news and things that I wanted to talk about. So we'll be back here on Monday with more. Probably going to take a little break from some of the pride stuff. I'm just tired of it. Aren't you kind of tired of it? Let's talk about something good. Let me know what you want me to talk about. Uh, All right. I hope everyone has an amazing weekend and we will see you back here soon.